as you can see, it's mixed tree country here. And as you can see, all the little trees have survived the slow burn. And it's, the temperature in here is real, real cool. There's no hot flaming heat in here. And because it's nice and cool in here, it's real good for the, um, the vegetation and the trees too. Victor, that's not what people expect to see with a bushfire. It looks very calm. And your colleague there is talking about it being cool near the flames. Well, what does right. he mean? Well, that fellow there, Jason, he's a Gadadjo uh, ranger in Bundaberg. And um, basically what he was doing there was a fire workshop and teaching him. And what I do, I go around and work with um, different communities, um, not just Indigenous, but also rural and fires and also partials and residents as well. What do you do? People. How is what you do different to the way the, well, rest, you know, the rest of the, the firefighting community different. operates? It's totally opposite to what everyone's doing here. Um, like, everyone's talking about the aftermath, and it's always the, um, the way Western, you know, um, society works is really based on the aftermath of things and always acting when things are too late, um, whereas all the work that I do is in the prevention of that. And it's really about putting fires in, not to save your house, just your house, but to save the bushlands, look after the environment as a whole, and above all, teach people what they should know about the country in terms of understanding fire properly. When you light a fire, how, well, is, how is that fire different to, say, traditional well, back burning? Firstly, the biggest problem in this country is that everyone's confused. Um, and that is, that's been done by different groups. Um, some people would go, oh, you know, like, um, we call this a... a a, a fire for hazard reduction and then they'll say oh, this is a fire for biodiversity uh, this is a fire for traditional burning that indigenous people do um, when in fact there's only one fire and that is the right fire and fire for your country your environment and a fire that is there um, more more um, frequently and what I do with the burns that I do um, I teach people in their own regions to read the country understand the land and be able to see the indicators and the signs on how to manage the country so we prevent wildfires. Mm. Explain to us what fire circles are. When we light fires, we just don't light fires anywhere. When I teach someone about burning the land, we'll go to the ignition point on that country, um, and there's a lot of reasons why that ignition point's there. And we burn out, and so the fire burns like a circle outwards. And when it does that, it's a single point, and the fire goes in a 360 degrees radius, everything can smell that smoke and everything can escape from that 360 degrees. So it Nothing protects the trapped. animals and... That's the... right. Mm. That is the primary thing that we need to be doing, is protecting the environment. Because we can't keep doing what we're doing. We can't continue to sit back and watch hundreds of kilometres of land being annihilated and yet just sit down and just think about ourselves. But in due respect, we need to be looking after our, um, our residents and we need to be looking after our houses. But what's the point of doing that if we're not looking after the land? What was interesting for me watching that footage was the trees weren't burning and the canopy mm. wasn't, That's right. wasn't burning. That's right. Th those are very f fire prone trees, but we burn at the right time and of the year and um, to make sure that they are protected. Those trees need fire. We live in a country that need fire and what's happened is that we've stopped evolving with fire. Our fire culture in Australia is totally flawed to nothing. Um, as before, even if you go back a hundred years, um, pastoralists and uh, you know, people who are historically a part of land can tell you themselves. There used to be fires all the time and even indigenous people would work in with them and burn country regularly. Um, but we've backed up to a point of regulations, land tenures. So how often are you going around doing that kind of work? Full time. I've been doing it for nearly 20 years. Going and around. are you doing it in cooperation with government or uh, no. agencies or are you just Not doing so it? Not so much. I um, cooperate with governments and agencies. I mean, agencies are my clients as well. Um, just recently I had National Parks in New South Wales get me involved in, um, in training some of their rangers down there and people as well. So how do you compare to the average firefighter in Australia, do you think, to someone like John? Uh, well, for John and, you know, I've met a lot of guys like John and great blokes and... Um, well, you know, it really is about understanding and they understand, like I said, it's about fighting a fire, you know, or reducing the fuel load. 
but there's a little more. Like for the future of a firefighter like John, in 50 years' time, if we do the right thing, it's going to be someone who knows the soils, who knows all the trees, who knows all the animals when they're breeding. And the other thing is that we need to be burning a lot more regularly. We're not burning enough. And they talk about 90% of Australia um, that are prone to bushfires. Well, I reckon there's only 10% that actually gets burnt through hazard reductions. Australia is a really big area and a big country. And unfortunately, um, this government has got to realise that there's a lot of work to do in um, making sure that we have management teams out there and that we are educating the community and involving the, the residents and involving communities in, in understanding fire, not in, a, in, in its vicious form or its threatening form, but understanding fire in its nurturing and its beautiful way of how beautiful it really is. John, your reaction to that? Uh, I think we have an enormous amount to learn from Indigenous fire practices and, and you know, um, until now governments and agencies have burnt uh, for mass and for area. It hasn't been cool burning, it's burned to, you know, the, the, to scorch the canopy now, if not cleaned out completely. So there's an enormous amount to learn. Uh, unfortunately, in southern states, in Tasmania and Victoria, a lot of that, that indig Indigenous knowledge has been lost. And so we're having to, to rely on, on, on people from outside of those states to come and teach us about these things. Mm. It sounds so thoroughly sensible. Mm. One, of the th one of the things that has happened, I guess, over the over the course of European settlement is, is the landscape has changed quite considerably and so mm. Europeans have introduced a whole range of different plants and pasture and that sort of thing so so how applicable some some of the traditional practices are in those landscapes I'm not sure. How it's applicable do you think they are? 100% applicable it doesn't matter we still live in Australia we still have the same climates we still have the sun beating down on us um, and what the challenge has been in the last 15 years for me was applying actually traditional knowledge into contemporary landscapes. Could you apply those principles to built up areas like you know parts yeah. of the city outskirts where there are houses side by side and yes. backyards backing onto the bush? Yes I've done that before and I've worked with um, many of those projects and of course you need to have rural fires involved and you need to have um, the community involved when it comes to that point. How different would people's backyards look looking out onto the bush if it was being managed the way you want to manage it? Well, the bush would be a lot more clearer from a head height. So if, if um, we're able to describe what it would look like, it would be green, it would be clean right through, and there'd be a rich green canopy along the top as well. So the country would look quite beautiful. It doesn't matter how big the fuel load is, and I'll be very bold and I'll say that it doesn't matter how big the fuel load is, we can always protect the canopy. And I've proven that so many times then from as far as North Queensland to Tasmania. Mm. And why is that so important to protect the canopy? Well, the canopy is a whole other world. The canopy is so important to us because it has, that's the life of the flowers, the fruits, the birds, the animals. That's a whole other place up there that we don't, we can't walk up there. Just like we can't walk under water, you know. So that top canopy is very, very sacred. And the simple rule is that it never burns. And if you burn the canopy, then you have the wrong fire. And, um, and so teaching how um, you can burn where fire behaves like water and it trickles through the country and it doesn't burn everything. Justin, how applicable do you think what Victor's talking about is to the whole of Australia? Uh, universally. Um, I think that that is the, the perfect explanation of how the bush could be managed um, on the other side of the interface and there's so many synergies between um, you know the the concept of a fire adapted community that um, uh, where someone's back garden enjoys a bit of fire activity the, um, the do you think people are ready for enjoying a bit of backyard fire activity <laughs> um, I, th I think it's yeah. a, an evolutionary process <laughs> but, but what they'll realise is their backyard isn't to the back fence. It's this incredible forest that you can once again interact with. Um, and a forest that won't bring problematic fire to the house and threaten it with incredible ferocity. But that is a cultural shift for a lot of Australians to accept the idea of the backyard, that's right. the backyard burn. And that's what's going to have to happen. There needs to be a cultural shift. We need to evolve our culture with fire. Well, you don't need to evolve. The rest uh, of us need to evolve. Yeah, basically, yeah. It's very frustrating. 
<laughs> it's very frustrating when I sit at home and I watch the news and I see masses of country just going and it brings a tear to my eye to see that country just being annihilated. And then I go down and I work on that country and have a look at the land and to see all the signs everywhere I go, there's just continuous signs of country just being just totally devastated. What do you think is getting in the way mostly or who's getting in the way mostly of you being able to do the kind of things you're talking about? Well, it's not hard, I mean, to know that. It really is, you know, the, the multiple amount of environmental agencies and um, red tape um, and attitudes. That environmentalist are attitudes? Um, above all, you know, like not just environmentalist attitudes, but... Not, also, I mean, by saying that, that that's sorry. a big umbrella, but mm. some environmentalist attitudes? Yeah, some of the attitudes in terms of just accepting Indigenous knowledge, for one, and then also just other attitudes of where agencies are more or less just um, want to do their own fire program so they can cease funding um, and run their own programs. And so we have all these different people doing different things and, develop, and delivering different concepts of fire. Mm. Yeah. Why do you think the things Victor's talking about aren't happening in a more widespread way? Uh, for all the reasons that Victor's just mentioned. I mean, we have multiple agencies with, with control over various bits of the landscape. And you, you look at any piece of landscape anywhere in Australia, you move from one agency to the next agency to the next agency into private property. 